Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. We're actually on episode 59, so thanks for uh, being with us today. I'm here with Maddie Grant. She's with NCIA. How are you today? Hi, good. How are you doing? Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, yeah. Happy St. Patrick's Day. If you can tell, I'm I'm here uh, in Ireland today. That's <laughs> the beauty of virtual is I can be anywhere I want to be today. Love it. The beauty yeah. of Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So so tell the viewers and listeners where you are today. And I'd also like to know, you know, kind of what your background is and uh, what your background is and how you got into cannabis and really what you've done up to this point. And just give some viewers some background. And then I've got some questions for you today. Great. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name's Maddie. I am the government relations manager at the National Cannabis Industry Association. Um, I'm from Maryland. Um, I'm, I work out of our headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm currently living in Charleston, South Carolina right now. Um, and I got into cannabis. I worked on Capitol Hill for a couple of years, um, you know, focused on health policy and really learned about, you know, the troubles associated with cannabis policy being a schedule one substance. Um, kind of, you know, fell in love with the issue and, and very passionate about it, especially on the medical side. So um, that led me to NCIA. Um, I've been with NCIA for about four years now. Um, I'm one of our, our lobbyists in D.C., so work to um, get legislation through and work with other groups in D.C. Um, and yeah, and so I went to University of South Carolina, moved back to the DMV after, and now I'm back in South Carolina. So. <laughs> Well, it's a it's a good path. So how did you get involved in cannabis? Like what what was the thing that said, I really want to work on these issues within medical cannabis, as you said? What was that or when was that where you said, I want to do this? Yeah. So so when I was in at university, I interned for a, a lobbying firm um, and they were working on developing research and learning about, you know, the pathway forward for South Carolina. Um, you know, legalizing medical cannabis. Um, so that's when I first got introduced to this issue. Um, and then later, a couple years later, I ended up when I was on work, when I was working on Capitol Hill, I was having meetings with constituents out of Pennsylvania um, and meeting families where, you know, with kids with epilepsy that were having hundreds of seizures a week um, and that were literally uprooting their entire lives to move to Colorado to get access to cannabis. Um, so that's when I, you know, really, you know, fell in love with and passionate about this issue on the medical side of things. Um, and I'm sure you all know of Charlotte's Web Medical Access Act. That's a bill that would just deschedule CBD um, from the Controlled Substances Act. So I helped to gather co-sponsors on that piece of legislation and then just learn more and more about the issue. So, um, you know, bring to, you know, we need full legalization at the federal level to respect our states and, you know, just grew from there. So that was, um, that's kind of my initial entry into cannabis and it's grown, it's been growing ever since. <laughs> The, um, you know, I've got some questions for you and I want to know, you know, more about what NCIA can do, you know, for the viewers and listeners. But can you tell me what you do kind of day to day there as as a lobbyist? What do you do, uh, you know, to 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 help the industry? But tell, tell us what a typical day looks like uh, when you're lobbying. Sure. So so lobbying is, you know, the way I explain it is the key factor is education, especially on an issue like cannabis, because there's so much misinformation. Uh, and there's a lot, also a lot of information coming out on the day to day. So basically, as a lobbyist on the day to day, you're educating uh, congressional offices. So members of Congress, their staff that handle this issue on the medical side, on the health side, on the tax side, on the banking side, you know, you're providing data and materials to help them sort through these these the policy issues and you know every member of congress is has a different level of being comfortable with this issue so you know mm -hmm. being able to you know take stepping stones with with offices to say, you know are you you're comfortable with medical but you know 
how can we get them to be comfortable with full, you know, recreational cannabis? Um, so that's something, you know, that's the day to day. It's being there to address questions um, and having meetings with with uh, congressional offices daily. Um, so that's one side of things. Um, and then it's also, you know, supporting your, you know, our champions on this issue we have in the in on Capitol Hill, we have champions that have been fighting for this issue, like Congressman Blumenauer, um, Congressman Perlmutter, um, or just name a few. And those are, you know, people that have been supporting cannabis for years. So, you know, we work with those offices to build coalitions to be a, a unified front when going on Capitol Hill, because, you know, prior to NCIA working on Capitol Hill as a staffer, you know, People know the cannabis issue. They don't know every single, you know, lobbyist or group or advocate. They just, you know, know the group as a unified front. And that's how you get things done. So, so there we there we then we push legislation and then we, you know, work um, strategically to get things done. So, if if medical cannabis is is the same as you know, let's just say rec cannabis. There and you just said, you know, if they're comfortable with medical but not with rec, what mm -hmm. would the major objections be uh, around that? Yeah, so that's a very great that's a very good question. Um, what we find when you look at Capitol Hill is an ongoing joke saying that Capitol Hill is always ten years behind American the American people. Um, I think that this issue very much so is you know, people demographically agree with that are not for cannabis because of just the way people were, you know, reefer madness era. That connotation with cannabis has developed the stigma and misinformation. So you have members of Congress that will never come around to this issue. They believe that it's so, you know, it's, it's not a good drug. There's no, you know, there's no benefit. They don't understand, you know, it's a gateway drug, you know, all those, all those issues. Mm -hmm. um, and there's sometimes you just can't change. You can't change the mind of a, of a member of Congress. Cause that's just, the, that's what they believe. And that's, you know, but then you have some offices, you know, you can backtrack a little bit and you say, you know, this is what happened in Colorado when they legalized and the sky didn't fall. And, um, you know, the money money coming through tax revenue is getting allocated to educational resources and community efforts. And, you know, it's the issues and why people disagree and aren't for cannabis. I mean, they, they vary, you know, I think it also comes down to I, a big one, like I mentioned, is just like the reefer madness era and people not the stigmatization being stigmatized for so long. It's It takes a long time to change history. And I think that that's why I always come back to education. It's just educating and, and, and giving congressional offices as much information as we can. Do you see over time that the, the, the people who have that, that perception will just, you know, um, not be around forever. And with a younger generation of congressional members, do you find that there's more openness to, you know, not that perception and that just time will will be one of the factors more than just changing minds over, over the coming, yeah. say, 20 years? Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with that. I think that it, it's just a matter of time here. I think that once the, you know, these older members of Congress are are exiting the con congressional halls, I think that you'll see, you know, younger elected officials that, you know, understand this issue from a different perspective and demographic. And, and you can kind of see that, you know, now, you know, you have some members of Congress coming in, um, on both sides of the aisle that are, are completely, you know, for this issue, you know, a newly um, elected Congresswoman Nancy Mace of, of South Carolina, she's, she's a Republican member of Congress. And you see, um, you know, she's, she's all about this issue. So, you, you know, you see the younger generations and that, and it's coming along. It's just, it's a matter of time. And that's always what it comes down to on, on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I, I still don't understand why it's a 
you know, right versus left issue. I mean, I, I just, I really don't understand that. But Yeah, and, and it's an interesting issue because, you know, although, you know, you hear, you know, Democrats are mostly, you know, for cannabis legalization, and but you see it on, on both sides of the aisle. And I think that it's important, you know, to get anything done, you need bipartisanship. So I think that that's important to recognize with and that we, you know, continually will work with both sides of the aisle and, and, and educate, you know, as many offices as possible to get things done. And when, what I've seen here in Colorado is when you start talking about the commonalities, specifically, you know, tax revenue uh, and medical, you know, benefits, then, you know, people can start to come together, work on those issues, and then resolve kind of the, the misperceptions or conceptions of either one on the other on the outside. Yeah, and it always comes down to compromise and, and understanding, you know, all sides of the issue. And, and, you know, that's how you get things done is, is compromising, you know, and, and working through those issues. And it, it's not easy, and it takes time. But, you know, that's why we're, that's why NCI is here. This, this is why our lobbyists are here, you know, to, to help mitigate those issues and help, you know, as much as we can. Well, I like the fact that you said it's about education because that's what this industry needs more of. So yeah, it's uh, valuable and, and you definitely have your work cut out for you, but there's also a lot of great things that have happened already. So yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a, a couple of questions really about kind of, you, you were saying something about, you know, local officials and congressional members and you know, how would you go about contacting them wherever you are in the country? You know, how do you start that process if you if you want to talk to someone about it? Yeah, so great question. This is something that's super important um, to our you know democracy and to government in general at all levels, local, state, and uh, at the federal level. Um, you know, working on Capitol Hill, I saw how significant it was when constituents reached out to us um, with their comments and, you know, questions and how it, it really did make a big difference. If, you know, we had constituents reaching out, um, especially, you know, and, and groups and masses of people, we would say, hey, like, this is a super important issue to our constituency. We need to address this. And this is, this, this needs to be brought up in discussion with, you know, the member of Congress. So, so basically, you know, I would say you have to visit, you know, congress.gov is a great resource. You're able to search um, and find your representative and your senators. Um, there you can find the phone numbers to the offices. Um, and if you'd like to write a letter, there's also the address um, to the congressional office. You will see that they'll have the DC office, um, and then they also have district offices. So I would recommend, you know, writing to the DC office or calling the DC office um, as you know, legislative. Um, that's where most of the legislative, you know, production happens, um, and you know that will come to the the staff in the congressional office, um, and they'll sort through. And usually, you know, they'll write. You'll get a letter back from you know the member of Congress addressing your issue, um, and not only that, but you know they keep record of exactly you know what what comments are coming through. So if there's a piece of legislation, um, you know that that comes up this Congress 117 session, you give them a call. They'll say, hey, you know, a constituent. They'll log you in the database, and then you'll be able to, you know, they'll have a keep that record, say, and come back to it. So, you know, if you support a piece of legislation, um, and you gather, you know, your friends and family to call in, it's super significant, and it, it makes it does make a big difference because when congressional offices and members of Congress hear from you, uh, you know, that's what they're there for. They're representing their constituents. So. So if I were to call a number, look up on the website, call, could I talk to someone or do you have to leave a message and someone gets back to you? You know, how deep does it go to actually talk about your concerns? Yeah. So when it depends how busy they are, you know, so if, if they're swamped with meetings and, um, you know, with committee hearings and markups or, you know, sometimes you'll get the voicemail, but usually they'll pick up they'll, the staff assistant at the front desk will pick up. Um, from there, you know, they'll ask you your name and your, your address um, to confirm your constituent because that's the only way they'll be able to log your information. If you're not a constituent, 
they can't, you know, simply just find like log you into the system. Um, and then you'll, you can have an, you can, you know, have a few sentences lined up um, and just, you know, express what you want to um, express to, to your member of Congress. And they'll take that information um, and, and store that and use that. So what would be the difference? Like, let's say someone just does a complete rant and they write a letter and they're calling every day. How normally would those get, you know, addressed? Would they just be ignored or or seriously, you know, responded to? Yeah. So so I would say it's, you know, it's I understand, especially on policy issues, how we can all be passionate and you want to call every day or, you know, leave voicemails or send emails or write letters every day. I mean, you know, you can call, you know, once a week um, and ch check in and say, hey, I gave you a call, you all call last week, just wondering if there was any update, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And you and the important thing to remember is that, you know, the staff that are working in the, in the congressional offices, you know, are, are doing the best they can. And if they have, they have an answer for you, they have an answer for you, but, um, but yeah, you don't need to call, you know, every day. It's, it's you know, you can check in and say, hey, I, I left my information. I just, I was wondering if you all had an update mm -hmm. on this issue. Um, so it, you know, and I find, you know, being, being nice and kind, like, you know, you get more of an answer than, you know, I know how we can get worked up and especially about political issues and legislation. So um, yeah, that, that would be my recommendation. Well, why is it important to, to do this, you know, this this process and how does it actually help? I mean, they may get the letters, get the calls, but how does that help the overall process to move issues forward when you contact a, a local official? Sure. So when contacting um, an elected official, it, it reminds them and it lets them know that, you know, their constituents care about this issue when they're hearing from the constituents, that's significant in the, in the fact that they were elected to represent their constituents. So, so, you know, you giving them a call is, you know, ex exactly the right way to move things forward. Of course, depending on what level of government you're looking at, things can move a lot faster, right? So compared to, you know, local and, and federal and state, you have the differences and the processes and, and everything like that. But um, it, it does not hurt to, to give a call and to express how you feel about something um, in, a, in a kind manner. And, you know, and for them to pass that along to, you know, the member of Congress, it's, it's significant. And, you know, to be completely honest, I, I didn't grow up in politics. I didn't honestly really even know that um, that people called their members of Congress until, you know, diving into politics and in, at university and, and really understanding the significance of what, you know, if constituents speak up, how big of a difference that could make. So if you've seen it firsthand, um, highly recommend, you know, reaching out when you can and just, you know, using your resources, using congress.gov, searching your state legislator, um, even, you know, just giving giving a call when you can. So you mentioned that things move at different paces. So would it be wise to do all of those, you know, kind of like a hyper local and a state and a national with the same issue or federal with the same issue? Or, or you know, how, how would you go about that if you really did want to be, <clears throat> excuse me, heard and responded to? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, I, and to be completely honest, I don't have that much experience at the local and state level. Um, but, you know, I think it's significant to just to be paying attention to, to what's to what's going on firsthand at, at the local level and state level mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, be aware if it's if if there's a piece of legislation coming up that you want to show your support for it or oppose. Um, I think, it, you know, I can't really speak to how the process at the local and state level and how that exactly works, but I know they're probably efficient at, at compiling, you know, insights and, and comments of their constituency. And um, it, it does not hurt. And I'd be happy to to link up some some more resources after this for people um, to find to, to, you know, be able to just quickly go look up their their officials. 
Great. Yeah, that, that'll help. We can post them in the messages below there for the viewers and listeners here. So I've got another uh, question for you, really about NCIA. You know, kind of what does NCI actually do? Kind of what are the benefits to, you know, obviously if you join the organization, that's a, a one question. But secondly, then what does the organization do and how does it further cannabis policy along, uh, uh, you know, in the country? Yeah, so so NCIA, we represent nearly 2,000 cannabis businesses across the country. Um, you know, we, you know, essentially are the trade association. We've been around for over 10 years now. So we represent the full spectrum of the industry, you know, from smaller businesses to larger to businesses. Um, we are vested in representing, you know, the full, full spectrum of the cannabis community and space. Um, so we we work in a couple of different ways as, you know, essentially the trade association, we host events, we host, you know, during the pandemic, we've done a ton of virtual events and webinars. Um, and then we have our DC team, um, you know, lobbying on behalf of, of the cannabis um, industry um, and businesses. And that's been quite significant because we, you know, we've seen quite a growth um, in terms of more, you know, groups and lobbyists and advocates coming into the space. So we we make sure that we are a united front and we work with other groups um, on a you know united strategy. You know, weekly meetings, um, and we use that. Um, to to lobby on Capitol Hill um, as a team with other with other associations and groups and um, and even individual companies, uh, we work uh, as a united front. So NCIA, you know, we have you know we talked a little bit about events, government relations, um, and then through your membership, it's also an opportunity to to network and meet other. Prof cannabis professionals in in the industry as well. So um, you know we have some great resources um, through NCIA Connect, where it's essentially you know a, a LinkedIn for the cannabis um, community, where you're able to talk and chat and have conversations about you know whatever you whatever you're interested in or whatever sector you're in. Um, if that's government relations, if that's packaging and labeling, if that's banking, you know, there's a place for, for everybody. Um, and then on top of that, NCIA also has our committees as well. So, um, you know, separated out through sectors. Um, that's a way for cannabis professionals to come together around the country and be able to work through these policy issues and present and, you know, use that information. And we present that to Capitol Hill and we that's the educational side um, and it always comes back to education. So that's a that's a huge, you know, huge plus of, of being a part of NCIA and being part of, um, you know, the, the united effort to get things done on Capitol Hill. So that's kind of the general overview. Um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know there, there are different committees like a sustainability committee. There are numerous ones. And I, I would highly recommend to the viewers and listeners to get involved. And if you're not a member of NCA, definitely join because it's a great resource and a good way to, to network and uh, meet like minded people. The, um, you know, I have a question about kind of people who have been in this business for a long time, uh, specifically talking about, you know, let's just say growers. Uh, you know, if you were a grower, you know, back in the day, let's say 20 years ago, do you find that there's a hesitancy in kind of having this all, um, you know, I guess out of the shadows? Do you see that? Um, you know, I, I guess my question is, what would be the the objections to joining a big national group like this if you've been in the business a long time? Yeah, so I, I think that it's it's funny you mentioned you know cultivators i think that's a particularly you know interesting sector of the cannabis space cuz you know especially i'll back up with compliance and all the state regulations that they need to comply with you know cultivators are super busy and i i know cultivators around the country that have you know some have 10 to 12 staff that are just focused on on being compliant with their state and their yeah. district 
Um, so I think that sometimes people think, oh, well, why do I need to jo join a trade association? I have all the business I need. I don't really need to network. I don't really want to be reached out to, you know, mm -hmm. and, but it goes further than that. It's, it's not just about, you know, what the benefits and the ROI of being a part of an association, it's about the overall mission and goal, right? So it's, it's about, you know, states have our beginning states have been moving forward. Our job is to get, you know, Capitol Hill to start moving forward. And when the more investment and the more backing and, um, you know, the more businesses we have, the, the larger presence that we have, and that will turn into, you know, that turns into movement. And that's something I think that people think, well, I don't, you know, this won't, this won't benefit me. I don't need necessarily, you know, the networking and events. I don't want to go to conferences. I don't want to listen to webinars, but it's more so the the overall mission, like, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's legalize, let's get this done. We, you know, power in numbers, you know, let, let's get things moving. Um, and if, if a company has, you know, the means to be a member at one of our, you know, three tiers, that makes a significant, you know, impact on on the larger mission and what we're doing in dc so it all comes full circle and you know if we when we do reach you know legalization at the federal level that's something that we can look back and say you know this is a united front this is what you know we were working to do and it makes the lives easier for the business owners and professionals that are dealing with you know all of you know banking 280e all these issues that affect them um, so it's almost it's worth it to get involved if you can. You know, the way that I look at it is it's not necessarily what can NCA do for me, but it's more like what can we all do to further all of us, you know, mm -hmm. by the participation. So uh, there are benefits, you know, for individual companies. And uh, it's not just a networking group, you know, with ancillary companies trying to sell one another. Yeah. Absolutely not that. It's about advocacy and lifting all the boats so it's uh it's a great yeah. you know a great organization i highly recommend if you uh, for the for the viewers and listeners if you have any questions to definitely reach out to maddie or anybody there about membership well uh, maddie how can people get a hold of you that information is great i'm sure the viewers and listeners have a lot more questions for you what's a good email for you and what's the website of ncia Sure. So you can visit our website at the cannabis industry.org. That's the cannabis industry.org. And there you can find a lot of our resources, information on membership, um, and just, you know, general information. Um, and then my email is Madeline, it's M A D E L I N E at the cannabis industry.org. So Madeline at the cannabis industry.org and you can just reach out and I'll be sure to answer you. If you have any questions, feel free. That's and great. I will be sure to link up some resources for you all too. There's some great blogs that our GR government relations team has, has wrote about the 117th Congress and we didn't get into that today, but I'd love to. We probably will eventually in another episode talk about some yeah. specific pieces of legislation and the momentum building in this Congress as well. That's great. Well, the last question here is, what are you looking forward to this coming year? This past year was a strange one. So uh, what, yeah. uh, what are you looking forward to? Yeah. So, you know, cannabis related, I'm looking forward to just seeing what we can do in this in this congressional session, you know, in the new Congress. Um, I think there's a lot of momentum that's been building. Um, and I know, you know, there's a lot going on with the pandemic um, and re relief and, and, and a lot of that is, you know, happening and taking a lot of time and, but I'm interested to see, you know, what, what markups can we get, you know, what can we pass? What, you know, what, you know, what can we do? I think that there's a lot, you know, a lot of momentum building. I, there's a lot of positivity in, in DC and I, I'm excited to see what we can accomplish. So I'm looking forward to, um, to continue on this good fight and keep pushing things, you know? <laughs> well, keep, keep it up. Keep fighting for sure. Well, thanks for being on the show. Uh, really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone.